Welcome back to Harbaugh. America is uh, waiting and watching right now. Like it or not, Russian President Vladimir Putin is President Obama's best hope to peacefully disarm Syria. Saddled with a war-weary public at home and a war-weary Congress at home, Obama has pinned his hopes on a diplomatic resolution whose outcome rests on a man who's lately made his reputation at America's expense. And now NBC News is reporting that a senior administration official here in Washington suggests the United States would agree to a key Russian demand that the U.N. resolution will not include the use of military force or the threat of military force against Syria as a consequence for noncompliance. Well, politics makes strange bedfellows, but as Cold War history has shown, our relationship with Russia is complicated to say the least. Putin's Russia may no longer be our adversary, but it would be an overstatement to call it a friend. But it's no overstatement to say that President Obama and his team need to deliver on this one in Syria, which won't be an easy task considering Russia's temperament. Anyway, as Winston Churchill famously said, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but perhaps there is a key. That key is Russian national interest. And now that we're playing the game on their turf, it's worth asking what makes Putin's Russia tick? With us now is Simon Marks, the president chief correspondent of Feature Story News, and Sergei Khrushchev, the son of Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union from 1953 to 1964. And this is a picture of father and son, by the way, going back to 1959. Sergei is now a senior fellow at the great Brown University's Watson Institute for International Studies. Professor, thank you for joining us. I guess the first question is, what are Russia's interests in Syria? Stability. Russia don't want to have all this fighting on their borders. They are now very feared about the returning Taliban in Afghanistan, and now to have the Syria near the Caucasus, it will be a nightmare for Russia. They need their stability and predictability, and they think that the President Assad is giving this stability and all this his opponents creating uncertainty because nobody knows who are they and who will be in power would they win. Do you think, uh, Professor, that the United States uh, and the West now have faces a common enemy alongside Russia of Islamism, the, the danger of the Chechnyans and the danger of the people in Al Qaeda? Do we, do we see the same enemy across the frontier? I would not say that Islam is the enemy to West or to Russia, but Russia lived with the Islam uh, peacefully for the last uh, uh, 400 years, and they had no problems. But of course, all the extremists are very dangerous there. And when you are starting fighting there, especially when you have this fighting in Syria, where it's fighting between different religious groups, it is the uh, Islamists from one side and other side also they're fighting against Armenians and against Christians is becoming very different because there you just concentrated the strongly motivated people who know nothing against we want to kill you and this is very dangerous for both sides. You know, uh, you know, some, you know, a lot of Americans don't put things together very quickly because we're not helped by the media. When Bobby Kennedy was shot by a Palestinian, uh, you know, by Sirhan Sirhan. Nobody said, wait a minute, this might have something to do with the Middle East and our position supporting Israel against the Palestinian people. And maybe this has something to do with world politics. No, it was just a, a tragedy left at that and the conspiracy theories. And here when we get the Boston Marathon with the bomber, the Chechnyans, nobody puts together, wait a minute, the Chechnyans are Islamic terrorists and the, and the Russians face Islamic terrorists, Chechnya versus Moscow, common enemy. Uh, putting it together and possibly a route to the opportunity for Putin and his own Russian interests to try to help us with Syria. Look, there's a whole raft of self-interests that are guiding Vladimir Putin in all of this, and certainly concern about Islamic extremism at home is one of those uh, self-interests that are driving him. But there's more to it, I think, with great respect to, to the professor than simply a desire for stability. There's also a desire to project an image of Russia as a major player on the global stage. That is what has been driving Vladimir Putin from the very moment that he became Russian president it is a desire to be seen as uh, sharing equivalence with the United States both in terms of refusing to accept that American democracy is a superior political system to the way in which democracy well, is, is carried out at thing? home. Is that a bad thing for the world or for us? 
for well, him. It's, certainly a, it's certainly a bad thing for, for, for the United States. Why? No Why question that? about Why? that. Because you see a United States that is embarrassed on the global stage after the events of the past 10 days. A United States whose government appears substantially weaker on the world stage than it was before. But we were weak time, before the Russians came along. But you're, you're, we were weak. We were weak because the American people were not interested in a war in Syria, but not because of anything to do with the Russians. But you're weak because you're being consistently outmaneuvered. It's not just by the Russians on this issue. The, the Russians okay, outmaneuvered well, you. Well, on let, the let, me, let me go back to case. Professor Khrushchev. Do, do, do you accept the fact that, uh, that Simon Marks just made the argument that a lot of this has to do with ego and the desire of the Russian leader to reestablish equality, uh, global equality with the United States? I think that uh, the Putin is realistic and he understands that Russia no more the uh, great power, it is not the superpower, if not the regional power. And the Putin interest is just to reestablish his position inside the former Soviet Union, creating the uh, custom union, economical union, and many other things. But of course he wants to be presented in the, in the world, and he is the leading member of the G20 as any of these countries wanted to be on this stage and play some role and present their point of view, but they will not be uh, interested in challenging the United States like it was during the Cold War and when my father was in power, where it was only two powers in the world who tried to deal with each other. That's for sure. It was simpler back then. Anyway, for his part, Vladimir Putin has relied heavily on the UN Security Council as a place to exert his control in the world, on the world stage. And he stressed its important role in that New York Times op-ed that ran yesterday. Nikita Khrushchev, of course, your professor's father, knew the iconic value of using the UN in a very different way. For theater, whether it was pounding the table in protest or disrupting a speech in protest, he used confrontation as a way to command attention. Take a look. None of us particularly will welcome in our countries a large number of officials, a large number of officials from abroad, a large number. I, I, and I'd like it translated if you were to say anything. <laughs> Perhaps the most well-known disruption was the legendary uh, shoe incident when Khrushchev removed his shoe and pounded on the table. The only photographic record that exists of that episode is this New York Times photograph, which shows his shoe right there in front of him. Needless to say, Putin and Khrushchev had two very different leadership styles. Uh, Professor Khrushchev, I have always admired the way that Khrushchev did one thing in history which saved this planet, and it may have cost him his job. And I'd like to re refer to that now and have your thoughts on it. In 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when there was a secret trade between Kennedy and Khrushchev, uh, uh, the United States agreeing to remove its Jupiter missiles from Turkey in exchange for the Russians removing their missiles from Cuba, that deal, I believe, saved the world from a real frightening situation. Russian interests there, American interests there, had nothing to do with ideology, but everything to do with common humanity. Your thoughts about that today? Yes, of course, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was two leaders in the world, rational, with no idea that we first should then think, and they prefer negotiations. It was very different culture at that time. We have the adversaries, not friends, and we negotiate with each other, and through this crisis, it was very important to this negotiation, because both leaders understood that they can influence each other and better understand each other. And then after the crisis, exactly 50 years ago, they created the direct line to easier negotiate with each other. Unfortunately, we lost this culture. Now we not negotiate with our adversary, we only negotiate with our friends. That means not negotiations, but a party. We don't negotiate with Iran directly. We don't negotiate with Assad. You cannot imagine that the President Obama will call to the President Assad at all. Mr. President, I want to talk with you and we'll try to resolve this crisis. I think it will, it will work and it will be maybe much less problems because when you're imposing sanctions and have the conditions on conditional surrender, it will never work. And we had the same uh, story in the Soviet history because when Khrushchev inherited power from Stalin, they have the same bitter enemy uh, Joseph Tito, and he was in Yugoslavia, and Stalin tried to assassinate him, kill them, and then Khrushchev told, we have to do it in a different way, and he yes. told, let's talk with him, and his uh, 
colleagues told, at last, let's talk with him, let's invite Tita in Moscow. And Khrushchev told, no, I am the leader of the great power. And for me, it is easy to go to him. But for him, it will be difficult to go to here because he have to apologize for me because he the leader of the small country. And Khrushchev dropped to the, uh, went to the Belgrade. They spoke there. They resolved these problems. Still, it was, there were many tensions between uh, Tito and Khrushchev, personal and political. But it was no such crisis. Now we lost this. Uh, culture I of see. negotiation with our Thank enemies. You. I agree and with I you. think and I, it's I, creating I, our world much safer. I think if the United States were willing to negotiate with honestly with Assad, Bashir Assad would get this thing done. Unfortunately, our negotiating position is you die. And that's not a very good negotiating position. Thank you, Professor Khrushchev from Brown University. And thank you, Simon Marks, for joining us. Up next, it's your chance to play hardball. I'm going to answer your Twitter questions up in a minute. This is Hardball, a place for politics.